Good morning. This hearing will now uh, come to order. More than 80,000 chemicals are now in use, and another 700 new chemicals enter the marketplace each year. Uh, Americans need an efficient system to evaluate the risk to public health uh, and the environment of chemicals on a regular basis and to have ready access to that information. Uh, that is the mission of the Integrated Risk Information System, or, or IRIS, uh, but IRIS now has evaluations of only about 480 chemicals. Uh, in recent years, IRIS's assessments have not been the open discussions among scientists we associate with scientific peer review. Uh, but have become a secretive process managed by OMB. OMB's mission does not include scientific analysis, uh, nor does OMB appear to have the expertise to perform such work. As a result of OMB's control of our, our, of IRIS uh, evaluation procedures, however, four chemicals have been listed by IRS, by IRIS, I keep saying that, by IRIS in the last two fiscal years. Uh, EPA scientists produced 15 or so assessments in each of those years, uh, but the assessments disappeared into an abyss of elaborate, endless reviews, mostly behind closed doors. A weighing of the need for assessments against the productivity under IRIS uh, appears to show that the system is fundamentally broken uh, and in desperate need of reform. Uh, instead, EPA and OMB appear intent upon choking productivity under IRIS further still and depriving the assessments of what credibility they have left. Uh, just last month, EPA unveiled uh, its new process for developing and reviewing IRIS assessments. Uh, the solution offered by EPA and OMB is to take an already broken system and to make it more convoluted, more secretive, and more suspect. The new system establishes an interagency process that gives polluting agencies even more opportunity than they had before to slow walk the IRS process to avoid the consequences of their own conduct. Uh, with the new process announced April 10, uh, we may view two new entries a year as the golden era of IRS assessments. Uh, as GAO will testify this morning, it is highly likely that no new chemical entry uh, that is the least bit controversial uh, will ever come out of the system in less than six years and probably more like eight years. Uh, if the goal of the IRIS review process uh, is to produce, uh, a, is produce new IRIS entries, uh, this system designed by OMB uh, and dutifully blessed by EPA's leadership uh, would be judged an abysmal failure. Uh, however, if the goal is to avoid new IRIS uh, entries, uh, or at least troublesome, inconvenient entries, uh, this new system should perform beautifully. Uh, it effectively kills IRIS without honestly acknowledging that intent. Uh, how does it kill IRIS? Uh, any new entry or revision will make it uh, into IRIS, uh, that will make it into IRIS will be of very dubious reliability. Any entries that make it into IRIS will emerge from a largely secretive process uh, that allows polluters to urge EPA to shift its science uh, so that it is acceptable to the polluting agencies. The public will never have confidence that EPA stood firm on scientific principle or fought off the combined forces of OMB, the Department of Defense, the Department of Energy, or any other agencies that may have a desire to avoid cleaning up uh, the, their practices or their messes. If the, if the science appears to have been reworked uh, behind closed doors to protect the interests of, of polluters, at the instance of polluters, who is going to believe the science? Uh, the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, OIRA, uh, at OMB, say that they are just managing an interagency process. Uh, that is a fiction. Uh, EPA is the agency that Congress directed in statute to do environmental science and charged with protecting public health and the environment. EPA has given billions of dollars a year in tax funds uh, to carry out that research and regulatory work. Uh, there is no need for the secretive interagency process that OMB uh, is requiring. Uh, the Department of Defense uh, and National Aeronautics and Space Administration, the Department of Energy, have entirely different missions uh, and entirely different areas of expertise. Uh, their interest in IRIS is uh, that of uh, an agency using the very chemicals that are being evaluated, not a scientific agency making decisions based upon science. OMB is using that interagency process uh, to undermine IRIS's, IRIS's 
uh, integrity uh, and take it away uh, from EPA's control. Uh, EPA uh, says uh, that this really is their process, honest. They control it. They're happy with it. Uh, but it is headed by political appointees. Uh, Dr. Gray is a political appointee. His testimony has been vetted and approved uh, by OMB. Uh, EPA's official response, even to the GAO report uh, we will hear today, was vetted and approved by, GA by OMB. Uh, and no iris entry can go forward without OMB approval. Uh, the Oversight and Government Reform Committee this week, just yesterday, uh, held a hearing and issued a report that demonstrates the degree to which the White House has controlled the opinions of the EPA scientists on regulatory matters. With IRIS, we see an even, that even in the realm of science, uh, before policy should have a role, uh, before economic considerations should have a role, uh, EPA appears to follow the dictates of OMB. Thousands of career scientists uh, must answer to political appointees without scientific expertise, uh, not about how to manage risk, uh, whether risk management measures are justified by the economic cost, um, but about what risk chemicals pose to the public health and the in environment in the first place, uh, a question in which political considerations should have no role. Uh, whatever your personal views or motive, uh, of motive or intent by the EPA, the political leadership of the EPA, or by OMP, I hope almost everyone would agree that uh, two new entries a year when 700 chemicals are entering the marketplace every year uh, is just not acceptable. Uh, I look forward to GAO's testimony today for offering advice to Congress on how to make IRS, uh, IRS relevant again uh, and responsive to the needs of the American public again uh, and not just to uh, agencies that are using chemicals and do not want to be disturbed, not, do not want to be inconvenienced, uh, and their friends at OIRA. Uh, thank you. Um, at this time, I would like to recognize Mr. Reichert of Washington, who uh, is sitting in for Mr. Sensenbrenner of Wisconsin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I ask unanimous consent to submit a statement from Ranking Member Sensenbrenner and a memo from the EPA into the committee record. And Without I yield, objection. I yield back. It is now my pleasure to introduce our witnesses today. Mr. John Stevenson is the Director of Natural Resources and Environment Division of the Natural Resources and Environment Division at the Government Accountability Office, uh, which just released a report on IRIS's new interagency review process. Uh, Mr. Stevenson, you will have five minutes for your spoken testimony. Your written testimony will be included in the record for the hearing. Uh, when you complete your testimony, we'll, we will begin with questions, and each member will have five uh, minutes to question uh, you. Uh, it is the practice of the subcommittee to take testimony under oath. Uh, do you object to swearing an oath? I don't. Right. Uh, please stand and raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth? Uh, Mr. Stevenson, the committee also uh, provides that you may be represented by counsel. Uh, are you represented by counsel at today's hearings? I am not. Uh, Mr. Stevenson, please begin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and other members of the committee. I'm here today to discuss our, our recently issued report on IRIS, a database that contains the scientific, scientific position on health effects of exposure to more than 540 toxic chemicals. IRIS is a critical component of EPA's capacity to support scientifically sound environmental decisions, policies, and regulations. Our March 2008 report concluded that the IRIS database is at serious risk of becoming obsolete because EPA has not been able to complete timely, credible assessments or decrease its backlog of 70 ongoing assessments. In summary, we found that EPA efforts to improve IRIS since 2000 have been thwarted by a combination of factors, including OMB interagency reviews, EPA decisions to delay assessments to wait for new research or additional uncertainty analysis, and the compounding effect of continuous delays. The two new OMB interagency reviews involve other federal agencies in a manner that limits the credibility of IRIS assessment and hinders EPA's ability to manage them. In addition, OMB is inserting itself into the decision-making process for, by, for example, requiring EPA to terminate five assessments EPA's own Office of Air said that it needed to implement the Clean Air Act. The effect of all of these changes 
to what should be a scientific process is that chemicals remain in the assessment phase indefinitely and few assessments are ever finalized. Indeed, EPA staff have prepared over 32 draft assessments of toxic chemicals in the past two years, yet only four have been finalized. Our report includes eight specific recommendations for streamlining the IRIS program, improving the transparency and credibility of the assessments, and ensuring that EPA has the requisite independence to achieve its goals. Recommendations that EPA in February agreed to consider before finalizing the IRIS process. However, EPA released its final IRIS process on April 10th, as you mentioned, and instead of seeking public comment, as OMB promised in responding to our report, made it effective immediately. To say that we are disappointed is a gross understatement. The new IRIS process is not responsive to our recommendations and is in many respects worse than the draft we reviewed. For example, the draft process would have made comments from other federal agencies part of the public record. However, the new process expressly <coughs> defines such comments as deliberative, excluding them from the public record. EPA's position that the IRIS process is transparent because final assessments must undergo public and external peer review is ludicrous. Transparency at a late stage after OMB and other federal agencies have had multiple opportunities to influence the content of the assessment without any disclosure of their input does not compensate for its absence earlier. In addition, the estimated time frames under the new process will likely perpetuate the cycle of delays and exacerbate the problems we identified in our report and sought to address with our recommendations, all of which were aimed at preserving the viability of this critical database which is integral to EPA's mission of protecting the public health from exposure to toxic chemicals. Instead of significantly streamlining IRIS, EPA has institutionalized an assessment process from the outset that will take six to eight years to complete. We all understand that science regarding the toxicity of a given chemical is never perfect, but at some point EPA must complete assessments so that it can take the next step of exploring what regulatory options are appropriate for protecting human health. My testimony includes several examples of dangerous chemicals that are stuck in the endless loop of assessment and reassessment. I'd like to summarize just one very quickly. In 1998, EPA initiated a toxic risk assessment of trichloroethylene, or TCE, a degreasing agent used wise, widely by the Department of Defense and others. Numerous studies have linked TCE to cancer and birth defects over the last decade. EPA completed a draft risk assessment in 2001, which was then peer-reviewed by the Science Advisory Board and released for public comment. During the comment process, questions were raised about the assessment by DOD and others that led to a request for the National Academies of Science to review it in 2004. In 2006, the academies concluded that the weight of evidence of cancer from TCE had actually strengthened since EPA's 2001 assessment. Nevertheless, after more than 10 years, TCE is back at the draft development stage, and the public continues to be exposed to this dangerous chemical. EPA estimates that its final assessment will not be completed until 2010. In frustration, five senators spurred by the TCE contamination in the drinking water at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, introduced a bill last year that would require EPA to complete its risk assessment and issue a drinking water standard within 18 months. Mr. Chairman, IRIS is a critical process that is clearly broken and needs to be fixed. We believe that the Congress should consider directing EPA to suspend implementation of its new process and develop one that is transparent and otherwise responsive to our recommendations. If EPA is unable or unwilling to take the steps necessary to improve this critical program, we believe that other approaches, including legislative action, may be needed. That concludes my comments, and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you. Uh, at this point, the, uh, we will now have our first round of questions. The chair now recognizes himself for five minutes. Um, I'd like to ask Mr. Whitaker uh, to display uh, chart figure one, good please. Uh, Mr. Stevenson, uh, displayed there is, uh, I believe, an EPA prepared uh, chart that describes the iris. Uh, process that exists be before 2004. Is that before OMB uh, made helpful changes, uh, helpful suggestions about what the process should be instead? Is that correct? Is that the that looks like a reasonable representation? We have a little bit different one in our testimony, but okay. Well, then now if if Mr. Whitaker could then display Figure Three.
All right. Is that is that the current process? That also is an EPA prepared uh, document to show their um, process. Uh, that, yes, that that looks like some of the new steps that have been inserted in the new process. Okay, I, it will be the testimony of the later witnesses today that that process is the uh, streamlined version of the earlier process, um, and I and that we should not believe our own lying eyes uh, that this really is more streamlined than the previous process. Uh, is it your testimony or your belief uh, that, in fact, that is a more complicated, convoluted uh, process, not a streamlined process? It, it appears to be more complicated, but if you put the individual time frames associated with each of those steps, um, we didn't invent the six to eight years. It's, it's based on adding up the amount of time that could right. be taken for each of those steps and two years additional for any chemical that's deemed mission critical. But just if, if our eyes tell us that this looks a lot more complicated, our eyes do not lie. Not in our opinion. All right. Thank you. Um, Mr. Stevenson, one of your findings was that the EPA needed to be more independent uh, and that the lack of independence was undermining the credibility of IRIS assessments. Um, did you – is it your typical procedure to show proposed findings to the agency that you have been examining? Uh, yes, there's a two-step process. Whenever GAO completes a review, we hold what we call an exit conference with the uh, affected agency, uh, usually at the program level, and it's really a fact check, if you will, to make sure that we've we've characterized the facts correctly. We did that, and then when we fin we go back, consider those comments, and we publish a draft report, which we then pass by the agency for official review. In this case, we passed the final report, report by both EPA and OMB since both were affected. And what was the result of that review? Well, it's, it's uh, um, the first process is not considered official agency comments because it isn't blessed all the way up the chain. Nevertheless, it represents the views of the program office people who, who run IRIS. And in that case, they felt like the, uh, the, the interagency review process that was being levied on them um, was indeed adding time to the process. And not only that, they felt like they could not move forward without an OMB blessing at several points along the way when, uh, when they had adequately responded to concerns of the agencies and other agencies and OMB. So in, in that sense, this science agency that, as, as you mentioned, is set up in statute to be a science agency, it was kind of in our, our view uh, being obstructed by uh, other agencies that don't have that as their primary mission. And, and in their own view, based on what they said to you? Uh, yes. I mean, uh, I, uh, OMB will tell you that EPA owns the uh, the IRIS process, but uh, um, it depends upon which part of OMB you talk to. Uh, the management agenda part of OMB says that EPA lose control of the process when they send a draft assessment to OMB, yet uh, the the uh, OIRA part of OMB will tell you that EPA still owns the process and they're only serving to coordinate the federal family of comments. Did, did they have they stuck with that initial response to um, uh, to the uh, um, GAO's uh, facts? They ask uh, that we not consider the uh, exit conference comments of the program office officials and instead consider the official agency comments, uh, which uh, no longer considered uh, the interagency process as obstructive or t taking additional time, rather that the real thing that took time was the complexity of, of virus assessments. Okay, so you, OMB told them that they did they were, in fact, in, independent. They mis, uh, misapprehended the facts when they said that they were, that that they they were not independent. The uh, OMB advised them that they were, and now it is their view that they are. They, they are the decision makers, according to OMB. Um, it, my time has almost expired, but I, I have two documents that have been provided to the minority, um, which I believe are the initial response of the staff of, of IRIS um, and then the official response. Um, and uh, I now uh, enter both of these uh, into the record. Objection. Uh, my time has now expired. Uh, Mr. Reichert for five minutes.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for being here with us this morning, sir. Uh, a question uh, about balancing priorities. How do you uh, balance the competing priorities of timeliness and thoroughness? Um, in science, that, that's always an issue. Um, as I said in my statement, uh, the science is never going to be absolutely certain on a given chemical. But um, in the judgment of the scientific community, they, ha they have to decide when protecting human health should be undertaken. You have to get into a, a cycle of risk assessments that, that takes about two to four years. To have it take 10 years, you'll never finish anything. Chemicals should be reassessed after 10 years, so it's obvious that you won't make any progress at two per year. You need more like 50 a year. Well, to follow up on that, um, until this new process was released, were there any schedules imposed at any point in, the, in this process? And that was part of the problem. There were no schedules imposed. So uh, now there's a schedule imposed on that complex uh, flow chart you just saw. And if you add all those up, the minimum you can complete an assessment in is six years. In other words, that's an unacceptable schedule. Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Thank you, Mr. Baird, for five minutes. Have you got any uh, insights into what the cost of, of the current situation is in terms of the, uh, the relatively slow pace and, and uh, potential bias of information? Well, I mean, if you don't have a, a credible risk assessment, you can't move from the risk assessment process to the risk management process. The risk management process is where you start determining what regulatory options are appropriate. So the cost and lack of protection to human health, I, I don't know how you would measure that, but, it, but, but it's got to be enormous if you're not getting these risk assessments completed in time. Now, you know, they can use other sources of science. They don't have to use IRIS, and they have in some cases done that. Uh, nevertheless, uh, IRIS was put in place to streamline the scientific process so that we could get on with the business of determining which regulatory options were appropriate for a given chemical. You know, I've, I've witnessed a pattern in the past. Uh, I spent a fair bit of time doing research on the area of risk analysis. And a rhetorical pattern, which is, well, of course we need to protect the public, but we must make that protection based on the best available science. And, and if the corollary is that you make interventions to slow down or obstruct or obfuscate the best available science, you then allow the prior argument to, to occur. Is there any of that going on where people are saying, well, we can't regulate because we don't have the information, but then obstructing the access to the information? I mean, we're not trying to say that there's intentional obstruction going on. We didn't try to find that. But that's why we do believe transparency in the, in the entire process uh, is so critical. It removes the perception of, uh, of a conflict of interest. Um, uh, we encourage DOD and, and, and DOE and any agency to provide comments on risk assessments, but it should be in the, in the sunlight. It should be available to the scientific community for scrutiny, the same as any other comments from any other organization is. What recourse exists? If you're a career scientist working for an agency and you have, in your best scientific judgment, made a case in a certain direction and it heads to another entity and come back, comes back in some way different than, than uh, what you had put forward, what, what options exist right now? Well, I mean, that, that's why independence of EPA is so important. They have to own the process. You have to um, hope that the, the credibility of the science will rule and that they will consider legitimate comments appropriately and address those kinds of concerns appropriately. Uh, but to keep all that uh, not from public view is, is not a good thing. Yeah, that's my question. So, so has, do we believe it has happened that someone has put forward a report that went to a different entity, let's say OMB, the scientific judgment in the initial report is in some way altered, influenced, undermined, blocked, and then it comes back uh, and, and is, is 
disseminated in a fashion different than the initial input? Um, I don't know that, but 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 OMB, DOD, anybody can correct, can uh, challenge the assumptions within the assessment, um, the uncertainty analysis, um, um, exposure uh, characteristics, and so. Uh, they can ask for additional research if they think there are gaps in the research, which can take up to two years. Um, there's uh, a certain amount of ad hocness to the whole process that is secretive right now, and, and you just can't tell what's going on. And to say again that there's transparency in the final assessment does not excuse its absence early in the process when you need to see what's going on with these decisions. Right. Uh and let me ask this question. If someone were to ask for, in the IRIS process, if someone says, okay, so this is our best available science at the present moment regarding risk of exposure at certain levels. Right. IRIS can, we don't ever expect to have the final answer on all these chemicals. We give what, what IRIS, I thought, was to get the best available evidence out there. That's what we're suggesting, that you should take available research do the best assessment you can, put it into the database, and you, the intention is to revisit it at least every 10 years or when new science becomes available. So it should be a, a you know, a moving, a moving database that, that is the repository for the best available science on any chemical. If that's the case, then, requests for additional information that are delaying should not necessarily delay uh, publication of a position. They should be included as a uh, as as a corollary opinion or a, a statement, explicit statement. But here is a question that is unresolved. But you don't necessarily delay moving forward with the with the information, right? But all of that rationale for moving forward or considering that science later in the next reassessment of the chemical should be open to the science community for scrutiny. Right, right. I mean, I think that's right. But there's a difference between saying we're not going to move forward with something until right. we get the additional information versus move forward with what you've got with the caveat explicitly stated that while we put this forward, there are these additional questions. What you're saying right now is that the additional questions can block moving forward. Exactly. Uh, if you wait till the science is perfect, you will never regulate, you will never complete a toxicity assessment. So uh, it's always a judgment call, and it's only the first step to deciding whether you need to regulate or not. It doesn't mean anything. It's just the best available science on that chemical at the time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Baird. Mr. Rohrbacher for five minutes. I've been trying to put into perspective uh, your suggestions on this particular issue as compared to some of the other issues that we face, regulation. You seem to be telling us we need to be speeding up assessments process. Certainly, no one, I, I, I certainly would not agree with the concept about transparency and openness. In terms of speed, um, now let me note that the in other areas where we're talking about chemical assessment, we um, have people taking the opposite Mr. Roebucker, it's very hard to hear your, your mic. Excuse me. I'll get a little, have to lean down here a little earlier. Or, Closer that is, um, the um, the assessment time that, for example, uh, the FDA takes in approving a new drug, approving a new uh, a medical process that uh, it can be sold on the market. Um, would you think that that we should be uh, speeding up those type of assessments? Well, I think they should all be made efficient, but this is entirely different than, and this is toxic chemicals. They're not things that you consume, not well, but, things no, that no, you it, eat. And, 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 it, and actually, it is something you consume. Well, it's uh, something that will affect people's health and people's, and it will affect in a big way whether or not certain people live or die. And frankly, with the uh, uh, FDA approval, we have the same situation. Uh, there are people who wait for years. Uh, and are told, oh boy, well, the FDA has approved this and it's going to save 100,000 people a year. 
but it's taken them 10 years to get it on the market. It hasn't changed a bit in 10 years. And so we have to assume that 100,000 people a year have been negatively affected by uh, not having it available to them. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, why is there a dichotomy then between... Uh, well, speeding up, speeding up the assessment now, but not wanting to speed up the FDA assessment. Well, let me just say that, Iris, you don't start from scratch in researching the chemical. It's based on a body of research that's already available. So you're not starting from ground zero. It's not a new drug that's been introduced. It's not consumed. You may be exposed to it in a variety of ways, uh, uh, airborne ways, or, or, or you're, not, you're not ingesting it like a food product or a drug. So the standards are completely different. Um, sp speeding up um, um, to me means you, you start with the available science right now and you c create a system where you can complete um, the synopsis of a summary of that scientific information on a given chemical within about two years. Then you're going to revisit it as new research becomes available. But if you never finish the risk assessment in the first place, then EPA can't move to the next step of determining what is appropriate in terms of regulating or not a given chemical. This is the first step to regulating or deciding whether you need to regulate a dangerous chemical. This is, this is deciding how dangerous it is. It's based on existing research, not new research necessarily. Well, uh, I think in both situations that you have people's lives at stake, or at least their health at stake. And, uh, seems to me that uh, there is a, pre a, a predetermined uh, uh, reaction with certain people that, that are trying to uh, basically uh, protect the public to the point that uh, the public is sometimes damaged by that protection, sometimes it's not. Sometimes, sometimes you can be overly protected find that the person who's trying to actually, in the name of helping you, is doing something that prevents you from improving your situation. In your example, you're, you're denying a drug that may save lives in the future. In my example, you're uh, not moving forward with regulations on a chemical that may protect uh, human health until you wait for the science to be perfect. It's, it's a judgment call in both cases. You're absolutely right. Um, um, but, but we're suggesting that if you wait till the science is perfect, then there's many, many, many more years of a potentially dangerous chemical that could, could, could uh, uh, affect public health. As, as could public health be uh, affected by uh, people who take uh, too long uh, in assessing something that could have impact on cancer or some other Thank you very much, and mm -hmm. appreciate your testimony. Thank you, uh, Mr. Stevenson. Um, if I could get Mr. Whitaker again to put up uh, the streamlined process, uh, Figure Three, <clears throat> uh, while it's coming up, Mr. Mr. Stevenson, uh, quickly um, explain again in, in a sentence or two the difference between risk assessment and risk management. Risk assessment is when you do. Um, um, you're really synthesizing the best available research on a given chemical to determine the toxicity of that chemical. What um, danger does this chemical What pose? danger does it potentially okay, and pose? What is, what is risk management? Risk management is when you take that information and you decide um, how serious it is, how many people are affected, right. what regulatory options might be available, what would be the cost benefit of instituting those regulations, and it's, it's a whole... Uh, a separate process that starts after the risk assessment right. so is complete. When Mr. Uh, Rohrbacher talked about some people, I thought he was probably calling my name, um, who thought we should be doing a lot to, you know, a good deal more to protect people from risk. Is that not risk management rather than risk assessment? It is. Okay. So this is simply trying to decide what danger to the public health and to the environment a chemical may pose. Until you know that, you don't know what you don't what know what you to do, about to do. It, right. or whether you need to do anything about it, That's and right. how to, to proceed with any kind of risk uh, or cost-benefit analysis. Is that correct? Okay. Now you talked about transparency. Um, again, looking at Figure uh, Three, and I've seen that you've got it before you, which may be easier on your neck um, to look down. Um, could you 
kind of walk through the uh, various steps where there is no public participation, there is no transparency. I, I don't have it in front of me, unfortunately, but uh, where there is no public where there is no public participation is when um, we are um, EPA is starting its draft assessment process, and uh, other agencies can comment on the approach and on what things should be considered. On, and on if they have research, they can bring it forward. And uh, oh yeah. because right. uh, with glasses on I can't see that but <laughs> this this is a science committee and science and technology committee doesn't mean we're all adept at technology <laughs> um, well for, for I think it's probably the uh, it's it's hard to tell I mean this is this is a very confusing process but in general it's the part where they uh, look at the draft assessment, determine if additional research is needed, uh, what default assumptions might be appropriate, right. what toxicity assessments might be appropriate. And the, so agencies, the agencies that are using the chemical presumably would have a chance to, to comment at that point. Exactly. They could say, I disagree with this in your risk assessment. Now, you may need to do this additional research or you need to consider that. Well, using, the, again, the example of TCE, is it your impression that the, the DOD's toxicologist would be participating uh, or someone else, at, or do you know? I don't know. Does someone at, 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 um, at Department of Defense would presumably be participating. How about TCE manufacturers? I don't know. You don't know if they would be given an opportunity to comment privately no, t um, or publicly. Well, we know they could comment I don't, publicly. I mean, t TCE is a degreaser that's right. widely used in motor pools and right. gas stations across the country. It's used everywhere. And, and if, the, if the Department of Defense's point is we really need to use this or our, or our, our stuff isn't going to work right, that's really more risk management than risk assessment. It is. If they, if they have concerns about the cost of cleaning up TCE based on a given standard, that's all risk right. management decisions. And if they're saying that this TCE is just not going to hurt you, uh, it's, it doesn't pose any kind of environmental risk, it doesn't provide, pose any kind of health risk, that's risk assessment. Exactly. Okay. And wouldn't you expect scientists to be involved in risk assessment? That's our assertion. Is there any reason that if there are toxicologists participating in this, that they, it wouldn't be an open, transparent process, it wouldn't be peer review, it wouldn't be an open, transparent discussion, argument, disputation, asserting facts in public for them to be questioned by other scientists, other peers, uh, exp expert in the field? Is there any reason that it should, that kind of debate should be private? We can't imagine a scientific concern that shouldn't be made public. All right. Um, and what expertise in scientists and scientists OMB have? I don't know. Is that part of their mission, to your knowledge? Um, there's no S in OMB, so I don't know. <laughs> okay. There's no public health. There's no environment. It's all management and budget. Okay. Um, Mr. Baird, four or five minutes. Stevenson, if there were an S, it would be OMBS. You, uh, you said that. <laughs> can you talk, back to the line of question I was pursuing earlier, can you talk a little bit about what it would take to, to, to change the current situation? Is this something we need to deal with statutorily, or do we need to just say to those who would meddle inappropriately, knock it off, or, or what do we do? Well, again, we had eight specific recommendations that, that EPA said it would consider in, in our report, and uh, it did not. Um, other than loosely assigning some time frames to this cumbersome process, I, I can't imagine what recommendation they did consider. So um, that's why we suggest in our testimony, you've got to remember that our report was written before this, this new process was unveiled on April the 10th. Our report was in March. And so we were, frankly, very surprised when this process came out. And uh, um, we mentioned there may be a need for legislation. Certainly, we would recommend stopping this process. Um, um, but there may be need, if EPA is unable to uh, make the changes we suggest in our report, then legislative action may be needed to, uh, to establish time frames and establish a process for them. That's not the desired approach, but I'm not sure what else can be done.
And you don't seem to have seen much evidence that they are going to follow these recommendations. To the contrary, uh, um, I, I think this process is worse than the draft we reviewed because of the transparency issue, because of the many bites at the apple that uh, agencies with a conflict of interest like DOD have that's now secretive and not public. Mm -hmm. um, all this is new from the draft proposal. Um, we are encouraging agencies to, to uh, participate in the process early. It just should, should be done in the sunlight and with better planning and advance notice of when you're going to do assessment, there's no reason why this process can't be shortened and still be very, very credible. Have any cogent arguments been made? Or, or what are the arguments that are made for keeping the shades drawn and not letting the sunlight in? The only thing that, that, that came up was um, the quality of the assessments. But um, if you take 10 years, the quality doesn't make very much difference because it's obsolete the, the day it's finished. So uh, there have been no good arguments that I can see why this process can't be streamlined and improved. And it's so, so critical to protection of human health that uh, we just have to get it fixed. It, in science, there are some occasions where things are, are confidential. The identity of peer reviewers and peer review, I think it's actually an error to do that myself. But. But certainly the data are supposed to be made available in science. The data, the assumptions, the, the methodology, process, the methodology, everything should be totally open. Um, how are you going to assure that the best science is considered and is in there if it's not an open process? So under current, this is admittedly a little bit extreme, but, but under the current situation, a, a risk analysis, risk assessment could be sent up. Someone with OMB or some other agency could say, Yes, but you haven't studied this under this impact in the strain of Norwegian rats R24A6. You have done with R24A2, and we won't let you go forward until you do 4A6. And just sort of throw that out there, whether or not it's relevant, but nevertheless result in a significant delay. Is that? It, it could happen. I mean, we have no evidence of that, but, but if it's not open to scrutiny by the scientific community, things like that could happen. It could be continually be assessed. If it's continually assessed, it's never regulated. But if it were made available, then people would have transparency, transparency and say, possibly, thank goodness for this agency doing their job. It turns out that the iris had not looked, or the assessment had not looked at something important, and, and the people who ask that more be looked at were doing a good job and a good public service. Or conversely, I have the, the, the publicity or the uh, the... Uh, transparency could lead some to say they are asking tangential, ridiculous, unjustified questions which are not scientifically defensible. It could go either way, right? Exactly. Very well said. Thank you. I would yield back. Mr. Rohrbacher for five minutes. Yes, I, um, I'm not sure if I agree with the chairman on his um, emphasis of uh, differentiating risk management from risk assessment. Obviously, we live in a real world. What we have to do is make sure that the activities that are being conducted relate to exactly what the impacts will be, just a theoretic, theoretical um, standard that is not associated with way things happen in, in our lives. Um, isn't it possible if the OMB would come in earlier? Uh, look, um, scientists, I, I, I have a great deal of respect for scientists, but I also know that sometimes scientists become too focused and do not fully appreciate the magnitude of what they are doing to outside to other people and other things outside of the laboratory. I, uh, and sometimes perhaps people, uh, and I'm a journalist by profession, by the way, I'm, I, uh, so I realize that I do not know uh, this much about anything, but I do know this much about that much. And sometimes it helps people to have the perspective, uh, science uh, authorities to have the perspective, come in and talk to them about putting their 
science and perspective rather than having it a purely scientific laboratory endeavor. Not? Well, yes, but I mean, the, 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 the toxicity, toxicity of a chemical is the toxicity of a chemical. It's not subject to the implications of whatever that assessment shows. That's risk management. Uh, that's when you decide whether it needs to be but regulated certain, or not. There, is it a big risk? Yeah, but there are certain areas that, for example, if a certain chemical is needed uh, to do uh, to complete a mission that is important uh, for the security or safety or uh, uh, even health of the of the public, um, that should be taken into consideration in terms of the risks that people take. Uh, in order to achieve that other goal. During the risk management phase, that's when cost becomes an option. Toxicity should not have no bearing on uh, the cost of that toxicity assessment. Okay, but, the, but the importance of that should not be part of a uh, determinant factor by the scientists at all? Well, that I mean, not be, we're not that suggesting that, that that the EPA scientists. Well, we're, we're not suggesting that the EPA scientists should go into a vacuum in a in a closed room and do their analysis. We're suggesting that that everybody should have an opportunity to comment on that. We just think that all the comments should be treated um, openly. That that well, the whole there's science there's community. No, there's no question about whatever communication happens, and I, and, and I've certainly. Uh, but, within but, government, should be people should be held accountable, and it should be transparent. I mean, I, I, I certainly I'm not com suggesting that. I'm suggesting that maybe what you're suggesting is that there be a lack of communication. No, no. Uh, uh, the cost of cleaning up a given chemical. Let's let's say, let's use TCE ag again. Let's say that that it's determined, and it has been by the National Academy and EPA and everybody else who's looked at it to be a very toxic chemical that likely causes cancer. Now we're, we should move to the risk management phase and decide, that's when you decide, okay, DOD uses a lot of this stuff, and if we set the cleanup standard at this level, it's going to cost them hundreds of millions of dollars to clean it up. That's a risk management decision. That Those factors, those cost-benefit analysis or, of the regulation let me put are appropriate, or let me put but not in the scientific okay, let me put phase. it in a different way. You've got a chemical that... Uh, is an important part of a, of a process that is used to uh, uh, save lives rather than uh, just put things at risk. And uh, uh, maybe there is a chemical that's needed in a process of, of a certain kind of food that's necessary to prevent starvation or, or to take care of uh, uh, certain types of diseases in Africa or, or such. Um, yeah, we need to know that that, that okay. that's important. That if, if that there's going to be no way to control the mosquitoes in Africa, uh, if uh, if this decision goes the wrong way. I agree, and those decisions are made all the time. You consider how expensive it would be for the regulated community to impose a regulation. All those are fair game and and appropriate discussions, but they're part of the risk management phase, not the not the scientifically based risk assessment phase of the chemical. Well, I'm thinking that, that what we're talking about is, and, and I'm not, again, you're much more fine than I'm listening, but it just seems to me that we have uh, process isn't as defined as all of these boxes that we've seen, and that people realize that, that uh, within, within a period of time, uh, perhaps uh, more science examination can come into the process rather than in the first box. It can also come in in the last box unless we have a totally closed system. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, and we're not suggesting a closed system. We are suggesting that it's appropriate for all commenters to comment on a scientific risk assessment. Well, I'm certainly not in favor of anything that would hinder transparency or putting making people accountable. Are we? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was the last round of questions, but I, just to summarize, uh, as if I understand correctly, your testimony in response to Mr. Orbacher's questions, you see no virtue in consciously not knowing and consciously not learning the potential risk to the health, uh, to public health, or to the environment of a chemical. None whatsoever. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, if we will now have a short break in the next uh, round of uh, the next uh, set of 
witnesses the next panel. Welcome back. We do have a couple of housekeeping matters uh, that I neglected earlier. Uh, one is I now ask unanimous consent that all members have two weeks to enter statements for the record without objection. Um, I also ask unanimous consent to enter materials in the record. Um, all the materials have been shared with the minority already, uh, again, without objection. Uh, I would now like to introduce our second panel. Dr. George Gray is the Assistant Administrator for Research and Development at the United States Environmental Protection Agency. Ms. Susan Dudley is the Administrator of the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs at the Office of uh, Management and Budget, uh, OIRA. Um, as our witnesses should know, spoken testimony is limited to five minutes, after which the members of the committee will have five minutes to uh, ask questions in, in at least one round and perhaps a series of rounds. Uh, it is the practice of the subcommittee to take testimony under oath. Do either of you have any objections to being sworn in? Okay. Uh, the committee also provides uh, that you may be represented by counsel. Uh, are either of you represented by counsel today or not? Okay. Uh, if you'd please stand and raise your right hand. Uh, do you uh, swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth? The record should reflect that both the witnesses uh, answered yes, that they do, um, so swear. Uh, at this point, we will now open our first, I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Gray, you may begin. Well, thank you, Chairman Miller, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before the subcommittee to discuss EPA's highly regarded IRIS, or in Integrated Risk Information System. As you know, IRIS is a repository of information on a potential adverse effects of long-term exposure to over 540 potential environmental contaminants. The IRIS program began in the mid-1980s. At that time, it was clear that the toxicity values that were being used and developed by EPA were not internally consistent across the agency, even when based on the same data. And this was due to different assumptions, different science, different choices of defaults. IRIS was therefore formed as an internal database in response to a critical need to have agency-wide toxicity values in one place. Word quickly spread about the existence of IRIS, and state and local, public health and environmental agencies, as well as the regulated community, asked us to make it publicly available. So in the late 1980s, IRIS was made available to the public. I've actually been interested in and using IRIS for many years. It was part of my research and my teaching at the Harvard School of Public Health. I've had a very long-standing interest in IRIS. Now the IRIS website gets more than 20,000 hits a day with inquiries coming from over 100 countries. Now, IRIS assessments contain only part of the information that's needed to characterize the public health and chem chemical, excuse me, public health risks of chemical substances in support of risk management decisions. It's important to understand not only how risk assessment differs from risk management, but also to recognize that risk assessments, including our IRIS assessments, include both science and science policy components. This is often a source of confusion. Now, like all living processes, the IRIS process has evolved over time. For example, efforts have been made to enhance our peer review process and to address the long-standing issue of the timeliness of our IRIS reviews. Because it began as an internal EPA resource, the agenda for developing IRIS assessments first focused on those chemical assessments that were needed by EPA. But now each year, EPA develops an annual agenda for the IRIS program and announces the new assessments under review in the Federal Register. In recent years, the IRIS program has also sought nominations for IRIS chemical reviews from the public and from other federal agencies. So some of these recent changes in the IRIS process include the development of our IRIS track web system so people can see the status of a chemical, new opportunities for the public and other agencies to review and comment on IRIS assessments, and enhanced independent external peer review of our draft IRIS assessments. In 2005, a formal process for documenting all the existing steps in the IRIS process, including formalizing some of these and some new recent changes to the process was initiated. And on April 10, 2008, this revised IRIS process was announced by EPA. The release of this is noteworthy because this is the first time that the IRIS process has actually been transparently documented and made available to the public. The new IRIS process has been designed to provide greater transparency, objectivity, balance, 
rigor, and predictability in our IRIS assessments. For example, improvements in the IRIS process help define critical and appropriate roles for public and interagency comments and for interactions that promote greater communication and sharing information between all interested parties and the EPA. The early involvement of various stakeholders is consistent with recommendations that we've received from our own Science Advisory Board and from the GAO. And remember that along with the increased opportunities for public and other agency involvement, all draft IRIS toxicological reviews will ultimately go undergo independent external peer review, and all final decisions on IRIS content remain with EPA. It's worth noting that the revised IRIS process also meets many of the recommendations of the recently issued 2008 GAO report. Specifically, we believe that we, the new process clearly defines and documents a streamlined IRIS process. It defines the critical and appropriate roles for the public and other agencies. And importantly, it sets time limits for all parties, including EPA. So although the revised process is expected to improve the timeliness of IRIS assessments, it is important to recognize that many assessments today are more complex than ever, and some assessments will take longer than others to complete. For example, recent NAS and Science Advisory Board reviews have recommended EPA do a better job of incorporating quantitative uncertainty analysis in our IRIS assessments. Right now, EPA needs time to implement and evaluate this new process. Recognizing the additional changes to the process may be needed in the future because it really is intended to be a living database and a living process. So thank you, Chairman Miller and members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to describe the scope, the purpose, and the future of EPA's IRIS program. And I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you, Dr. Gray. Ms. Dudley for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Miller and distinguished members of the committee. As Administrator of the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, or OIRA, I'm pleased to be here today to talk with you about OIRA's role in ensuring that the highest quality of information, including scientific information, is used and disseminated by federal agencies. OIRA was created as part of the Office of Management and Budget by the Paperwork Reduction Act of 1980. Staffed almost exclusively by career civil servants, OIRA has served administrations both Democratic and Republican for decades by providing centralized oversight and interagency coordination of federal information as well as regulatory and statistical policy. In recognition of the increasing importance of science-based regulation at federal agencies, OIRA staffing has evolved over the last eight years to include scientific and engineering expertise to accompany a well-established team of economists, statisticians, lawyers, and information policy specialists. This more diversified pool of expertise enables us to engage with federal experts throughout the government on issues relevant to policy development. Since the fall of 2005, OMB has coordinated interagency review of the Environmental Protection Agency's IRIS. IRIS is an important online database containing science and science policy information on chronic human health effects. It supports risk-based decision making not only by EPA, but by other federal agencies, state and local environmental programs, international regulatory bodies, academia and industry, and others. Interagency coordination allows EPA to take advantage of the broad scientific expertise that exists throughout the government. The science in IRIS assessments is growing more and more complex, and vigorous discussion among a diverse set of governmental experts help EP helps EPA ensure that the IRIS assessments reflect consensus on the best science and science policy judgments. OMB has continually supported changes that will improve the quality and efficiency of the IRIS program. Since 2000, OMB has supported funding increases of over 450 percent, and IRIS's program budget has increased from 1.7 million in fiscal year 2000 to 9.6 million in fiscal year 2007. Despite this increased funding, concerns remain with the pace of the development of IRIS assessments. EPA observes that, th that assessments take an average of five years to complete, with some taking as long as 10 years. In response to concerns both with delays in implementing IRIS assessment and lack of transparency in the IRIS process, EPA has recently revised the process to clarify the role of the public and interagency reviewers and promote greater communication and sharing of information between all interested parties and EPA. The new process is expected to reduce the time to complete an IRIS assessment from the historical average of over five years down to three to four and a half years. 
EPA expects these changes will result will result in more predictable, streamlined, and transparent process for conducting IRIS assessments, which will ultimately lead to assessments that are of the highest quality and rigor. So in conclusion, let me reiterate a few key points. EPA's IRIS database is a highly regarded database of the potential chronic effects of environmental contaminants on human health. It is widely used within EPA by other federal, state, and local agencies and elsewhere to support policies to protect human health. It includes science policy as well as pure science, quantitative risk estimates, and qualitative narratives. Scientists at other federal agencies and the public have an appropriate role in the development of IRIS assessments. EPA's recent clarifications to the process for developing IRIS assessments should improve both the quality and efficiency of assessments by engaging the public as well as experts within and outside the government earlier in the process and providing streamlined opportunity for review and comment. I have a, a few seconds left on my clock. Um, I'd like to um, correct a misimpression that may have been left from the, pa uh, the last panel. Um, OMB did not review EPA's response to the GAO report, as was suggested. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dudley. Um, Mr. St there's only three witnesses today. Um, Mr. Stevenson, would you mind rejoining the panel so you might be able to respond to questions that were directed to all of us um, because your testimony <laughs> has been very different from the testimony that we have um, heard from others today. Yes, it has. Um, again, if Mr. Whitaker could put up figure one. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I might note that uh, we didn't have these witnesses available to comment on his testimony. Well, they certainly at the time when he was testifying, it seems to be not quite a balanced decision on your part. Dr. Gray, do you have anything to say in response to anything Mr. Stevenson said? Uh, areas where I think that there are some misperceptions in some of uh, Mr. Stevenson's. Yeah, perhaps we can elaborate upon those as we go along, Ms. Dudley. Okay, could you? Yes, I do. Too. Could I you do just well. tell me the topics quickly, and we perhaps we can try to hit those as we ask questions, Mr. You know, Warbacher? I, I, I don't have notes on all the topics. Um, one was the notion that OMB reviewed um, EPA's response to the GAO report, which is not true. OMB did not review that. You've already you've already said that that was simply not true. Um, is there anything that you want to elaborate besides that it's not true? Yeah, um, uh, the suggestion that OMB doesn't have scientific. Um, I'll, you know, hit um, Mr. Stevenson's response was that there's no S in OMB, but there's no S in O either. Okay. Um, or EPA. <laughs> that's right. So I don't think whether there's an S in the title of an agency qualifies. Well, I didn't mean that literally. Well, did, did it, well <laughs> we haven't really begun our line. Of, well, I guess I will now recognize myself for five minutes. <laughs> um, <laughs> Following that, Ms. Ms. Dudley, do you think it is part of the role of OMB or OIRA to review scientific assessments uh, prepared by other agencies of government? Um, OMB serves a coordinating function. We coordinate interagency review of various things. And so OMB's role, I think, is a legitimate role. We have scientists that engage other scientists throughout the federal government in reviewing IRIS assessments. Well, I understand that there is one toxicologist who works for OIRA. Is that correct? Um, you know, I'm not sure exactly their credentials. We have toxicologists, risk assessors, statisticians. Um. Well, they're, they are remarkably productive because they, they respond point by point in great detail uh, at, at great length to the assessments that come up from, from the scientific agencies of government. Um, is that all done in-house, or are there others who are invited to participate in uh, OIRA's work or OMB's work? Um, no, it's um, it's certainly an interagency effort. So o I OMB doesn't um, doesn't provide the we don't do the analysis. We coordinate with other agencies. So we take advantage of the expertise throughout the federal government. So at the do you take H advantage HHS, of expertise outside of the federal government? Um, no, as a rule, OIRA does not do that. Um, our our role is coordinating within the government. Okay. Well, okay. If we could turn back our attention to Figure One. Uh, this is the IRIS process that existed before OMB, OIRA made helpful suggestions 
to make sure to try to make this a more uh, productive, transparent system. Is that correct? I'm going to have to defer to Dr. Gray on that. And I'd say the, the first thing I have to say is that um, these diagrams, I, I don't necessarily, I am not able to endorse these because I, I wasn't involved in preparing them. I, actually, and in it fact, says I'll it, say. It, 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 these no. are not. These are not diagrams prepared by critics of no. OMB or no. EPA to belittle or make a mockery of the complexity of the process. These are actually EPA documents. Yes, they are. And the only reason I am unable to completely verify things is that the process that we use in IRIS prior to April 10th was never written down and made publicly available. Okay. If we could now look at figure three. I ask, do you have hard copies of those? It's hard for us to see them on the screens. Uh, I, okay. Do, do you, is your need now satisfied? <laughs> okay. This, this is the streamlined version, the tra streamlined transparent version of the earlier slow, um, opaque process. Is that correct? This is. This is, this is this, what was recently adopted. This is our process, yes, that is codifying many of those enhancements that I've mentioned that have been going on in the IRIS process for many years. They are designed to enhance the transparency and the timeliness of our process. And in fact, putting timelines on this, which are not on this diagram, I noticed, is very helpful in that it reminds both EPA of its responsibilities and the others who are involved in their responsibilities. It also indicates all of the various places where the EPA, its regions and program offices, the public, non-governmental organizations, anyone but, with the scientific community, and other agencies can come together to provide input to our process. So that's a yes. Um, let me ask the same question that I asked of Mr. Stevenson to, to clarify or to summarize his testimony in response to Mr. Warbacher's questions. Do either of you see a virtue in consciously not knowing and consciously not learning the environmental or public health risk posed by a chemical? That's a yes or no answer. No. Not at all. Not at all. Not okay. at all. And the purpose of IRIS is, is that, to, to assess what the risk is. IRIS is an input to the risk assessment process. It is not a complete risk assessment. Okay. But it is not risk management. That is correct. Okay. Doc, Ms. Dudley, it is not risk management, correct? Correct. IRIS is not risk management. Okay. It's it, a component it, of the risk. There's a later decision about what to do about it if, if a chemical poses a risk. But the IRIS decision, the IRIS listing, is the best available science at the time of what risk a chemical poses. Isn't that right? It's, it's, it's science and science policy, because science doesn't give you the full answer, so there are policy judgments involved. Well, the policy is what, what scientific assumptions to make if the, if the data is incomplete. That's correct. That's still, it deals that's with still uncertainty. science. It's not, a policy might be, do we really need to use TCE even if it is toxic because our machines, our Bradley fighting vehicles work better, and it's important that our Bradley fighting vehicles work better. That's policy, right? I'm sorry, could I make a statement? I noticed that's risk, fact, that's risk management. That is management. Risk policy, I noticed there's a copy of the NAS Red Book next to you. Chapter 1, the very first thing after defining, te defining terminology says science and policy in risk assessment. That's okay. the kind of policy we're talking about. All right. Um, well, my time has expired, but there will be other opportunities. Mr. Warbacher for five minutes. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> so, Dr. Gray, you were mentioning these charts that uh, have been shown a number of times in this hearing. Uh, so you're suggesting that the chart that uh, has been given to us every <laughs> during this hearing is not an officially approved chart from your agency. I'm just saying that I was not involved in drafting them, and it, it's there are... Um, questions about defining the previous versions of the process simply because they were not written down in the same way as we've now done. Not quite understanding the answer whether that was a... Um, it seems that you're saying that this chart then was developed by somebody in your agency that uh, 
was not uh, officially entitled to uh, uh, have the final word on what the what the uh, flow chart would uh, No, I don't think that's quite it. It's my understanding that those were put together in an effort for our staff to come up here and brief uh, brief the committee and we use those to brief some other committees. What I'm saying is that I didn't um, I was not involved in putting those together. The only one of those that I can say accurately, just to the best of my knowledge, completely accurately reflects the way things are done is the last one that does reflect the new process that we've released. So the flow chart, uh, complicated flow chart that yep. we see, does not reflect or does reflect? That does reflect the process as it is currently defined. And what is your disagreement then with the chairman of the uh, flow chart, I was not quite understanding oh, simply why you brought up the, that point. Well, be, because it's it's very difficult, I think, to accurately compare these, because in the past this process has not been written down as explicitly and transparently as it is now, so that knowing exactly what the process was in each of those steps is a little harder. So the other flow chart, the fir the original one that's been presented to us as the formerly streamlined process. Uh, now has been made more complicated, actually does not reflect the complication of what it was before. Well, well, to me, complication is not what this is about. This is about making sure we're doing the right science. Those processes that we were looking at, and I believe it was chart one and maybe chart two, are the ones that have us in the place today where we have assessments that are taking over 10 years to do. That's not what I want. That's not what EPA needs. The new process is designed with timelines and milestones to help us move that process along and actually, though it may look more complicated, I believe it's both more streamlined and will be more efficient. Okay, so what you're suggesting then is that because something looks more complicated, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's more time consuming and complicated. No, I would suggest that's exactly true. Well, I think that's a disagreement you have with our chairman, but uh, I'll follow through on that. Thank you, uh, I think that sometimes, well, yes, I really understand that you can, sometimes cannot believe your eyes. Thank you. Well, as I said in the opening, um, that we should not, that apparently it is your testimony, we should not believe our lion eyes, uh, that the, uh, the flow chart that was prepared by our staff, I'm, I'm advised by our committee staff that all the charts were prepared by our committee staff and prepared to our staff as part of our preparation for this hearing. Isn't that correct? I believe that's what I, I just okay, said. So you may not have done it, but it was our staff correct. that prepared the, the charts that described the process as it existed along the way before 2004, before uh, OMB and OIRA began making helpful suggestions about how it might be different, how it existed from, a, from 2004 to April 2008, and how it exists since April 10, 2008. Isn't that right? That's correct. All right. Um, there's been discussion of transparency um, in the, well, it's not really possible to describe how many steps there are because there's so many kind of sub-numbers. Um, but say, for instance, looking at um, two F, step 2F, federal agencies identify mission critical chemicals. Is that step transparent? Does the public know what the agencies have had to say about what chemicals are mission critical? The designation of mission critical is something we expect to happen very, very infrequently. When it does, it happens in consultation with and with the agreement of the EPA. If that, in fact, is something that is, uh, if that designation is made and agreed to by the agency, it would be certainly made um, made known publicly. The, the the final decision or the uh, the viewpoints that went into the decision. The decision that this has been chosen to be mission critical and that the agency had agreed that, in fact, there were specific areas of research that could be conducted in a short amount of time that would provide additional information okay. to improve how, the how risk assessment. How about step 8B, internal agency review of draft assessment? It has always been the practice that our discussions that we have within our agency, where I can tell you there is rarely scientific agreement, those are always kept 
to the um, are always kept deliberative within the agency. So if it was a chemical that was being used by the Department of Defense, the Department of Defense, that would be the step at which, that, or a step at which the Department of Defense would say whatever they had to say about TCE being on the iris list, about whether it should be on the list of chemicals that we know something about the risk, um, what we know about the risk. Is that right? <coughs> uh, I'm sorry. Could, could you well, – I wasn't it, sure what your question was. 8B, internal agency review. Is that your own agency or is that – Yeah, no, that's EPA. And as I said, okay. our remarks in EPA have always been kept deliberative. It's something that um, – and are not released publicly. <coughs> Interagency review. All right. How about nine? OMB interagency review of draft assessment and peer review cha uh, charge. Is that public? No, that is interagency. Okay. It, <coughs> what would happen at that step? Uh, this is when uh, the um, Office of Management and Budget would coordinate a review of the document by other federal agencies. Comments would come in to EPA, they would be combined with our comments that we had from within our agency and would be considered in ultimately revising the, uh, the document that would then go, very importantly, to step 10A, external peer review, so that any scientific choices, any scientific decisions that are made in that document have to pass independent external peer review. Well, what, who would be commenting at that point? Would, would Department of Defense, if you're talking about a chemical used by the Department of Defense, would Department of Defense, that, would that be where they would have something to say? This process opens up the, the ability for comment much more broadly for, than the previous was that comment. A yes? For the agencies, for, for the public, now, and I'm, for I'm other interesting talking parties. about nine, interagency review of draft assessment, pure. Is that, right. is that where the Department of Defense would have, a, would, would have something to say? It's my understanding, and I don't know how OMB does the formal process for reviewing these, but this would go out to all of the federal agencies to have an opportunity to comment. And, that and as be... the GAO has recognized, we often get very useful comments back from that interagency process. Okay. And that's public or private? Those are deliberative within but the executive branch. That means it's not public? That's correct. Okay. Um, now, if this is all about what risk a uh, chemical poses, not what to do about it, but what risk it poses. Isn't that entirely a scientific decision? No. Are it's toxicologists at DOD commenting? Who are you getting from DOD? I don't know who all of the commenters are, but again, as GAO has recognized, EPA says those comments that come in are useful. But again, they can be comments on science and on the science policy decisions and choices that are made Which in is the also assessment science. process. Which is also science. No. It's, it, it, of course we, have it a is. we have a separate process in our agency, for example, for dealing with science policy. We develop guidelines for those choices. They're vetted through our science policy council. What? This is the, what they, would we be keep the, these two things separate. Why? Uh, no, yeah. What would be the purpose of having this be a deliberative process rather than open, transparent, having everyone who had anything to say um, say it right out in front, right out loud in front of God and everybody? So everybody else who has expertise can comment on what they had to say, whether their factual assumptions were correct, whether their analysis is correct or flawed, uh, whatever. Isn't that the whole nature of peer review? Isn't scientific analysis open? Ms. Dudley. Mind if I comment on that? Um, I think the purpose is that um, healthy skepticism and frank discussion, so candid discussions among scientists throughout the government, actually makes for better results. And let me just read to you from the National Academies. Um, they, they frequently ask questions. Deliberative portions of meetings, and this is the National Academy of Scientists. Deliberative portions of meetings are closed to allow the discussions and consensus process to proceed frankly and without public posturing so that committee members are free to change their positions in the face of evidence or argument. That's the same nature, the same reason as Dr. Gray said, the discussions among EPA scientists who don't always agree, discussions among interagency scientists, providing that opportunity for candid, frank discussion is valuable. Mr. Stevenson, do you have anything to say on this point? Well, any time you want to question a risk assessment, um, whether it's um, what Dr. Gray is referring to as science policy or not, um, I still see no problem with um, 
the toxicologists at DOD suggesting that uh, you don't have a good enough uncertainty analysis, why can't that be made public, the basis for that statement? It's not to say that individual scientists within DOD statements would be available, but at least the DOD position on that particular risk assessment or why they're concerned with the science wouldn't be publicly available. I just I can't understand a scenario in which uh, deliberative, if, if it encourages more frank and open conversations with the, the federal family, why doesn't it encourage more frank and open conversations with other public commenters? Uh, I mean, I, I, the, the logic defies me. I now recognize myself for another, well, do you wish, yeah. Dr. Gray, before I recognize myself for another five minutes, do you wish to comment on what Dr. Mr. Stevenson had to say? I, I, I did want to say that I think it is important for these discussions to take place. One of the, um, the new <clears throat> enhancements in the IRIS process um, that's here is something that we call listening sessions, in which we open up and invite scientists from the, um, from the public, from industry, from environmental organizations, to all come in and to have a discussion about the science of a particular assessment at two different points here to make sure that we are hearing a wide range of views and we're getting that kind of input. We think that's very important. But now I recognize myself for um, five more minutes. Um, is there any stage at which a TCE manufacturer would have a say? Would TCA be able to talk to OMB? Would TCE fit in any of these boxes of TCE manufacturer? Would, a, would someone outside the, a federal government agency have any chance to comment other than the public comment? Can I say here, th th this goes right back to my previous point of these listening sessions. Previously, there, have, there are contacts that come from various affected parties that may be an industry or a manufacturer or a user. Right. Is that, is that public comment? No, is, now, that's not public. Now that's private. Now, it hap now in the new process, that will happen in these open public listening sessions. Okay. Is there an opportunity for a manufacturer other than the public open listening sessions to, uh, to have a say? Do they fit in any of these boxes or do they talk to OMB, to OIRA? I cannot speak for that. In our case, the n intention now is to have these listening sessions, which are open, publicly available, right. as the way right. that anyone who wants to bring scientific Any other information chance. brings it in. Any chance to do it in a deliberative way, not a public way, but deliberative way? No. Okay. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Ms. Dudley, is there any opportunity for deliberative? No, not to my knowledge. The OMB doesn't talk. To any, does not talk to manufacturers. There are no we, we, we talk to other federal scientists. Our role is coordinating scientific dialogue between scientists within the federal government. Mr. Chairman, could I add a, a comment here? Mr. Stevens. In, in the course of doing our work and, and having discussions with DOD, DOE, and NASA, uh, none of them really had objections to their comments on the scientific risk assessment being made public. So, um, I'm not sure where this come from, this 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 need for deliberation comes from. All right, um, you're so I'm sorry, Dr. Gray and Ms. Dudley, you are both testifying that there is no step in this whole process, there is no procedure by which a private party, not a government agency, a private party, can participate, formally or informally in a deliberative way and not and not in a public way but privately. Ms. Dudley, is that correct? I'm not familiar with the entire process. I know that the process, the, the two steps that OMB manages interagency review, that is not an opportunity for people outside the government to weigh in. Okay. Now both the EPA and OMB have recently asserted in, in congressional testimony and refuse to answer questions based upon the deliberative process privilege um, that internal government decisions, discussions are not subject to, I, I don't agree with it, I'm stating that the assertion, the privilege that, that the uh, that EPA and OMB has asserted. Um, do you contend that if there were private conversa conversations with those outside of government that they would be subject to any privilege? You know, I'm not a lawyer. Um, I know that, that our process is that in, in our regulatory review as well as the IRIS review, um, we, we do not talk to people outside the government. In our regulatory review, we operate under Executive Order 12866. And under that, when we, 
when we have a regulation under review, if we're to meet with people outside the government, we post that on our website, we post the attendees to that meeting, and we also invite the agency. Okay. So I, we, there's a balance to be struck, and I, I understand where you're going. There's a balance to be struck between the deliberative process to allow for that frank and candid discussion and also the public's need for transparency and needs to know. And I think that we try to strike that balance. Um, in the IRIS process, it's through this new procedure, and in the regulatory process, it's through our post transparent posting of meetings with people outside the government. Dr. Gray, do you, you're, you're, the head of your agency asserted that privilege yesterday and refused to answer a direct question in Actually, another committee. Um, if I could just quickly correct that, I was sitting next to him and he did not assert that privilege. <laughs> I'm sorry. He, he didn't actually say those words. He just said he wasn't going to answer. So do, do you attend, assert that there is a I don't feel like telling you privilege? Um, the, only the president can assert executive privilege, right. and to my knowledge, he has not done that in the issue at the, of the testimony yesterday nor today. Do you have any idea the nature of the privilege uh, upon which the head of the EPA uh, was relying in refusing to answer direct questions in a committee? Are we discussing yesterday or? Um, no, well, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out which what of this is going to be available to a congressional oversight committee. On, on, on this issue, actually, Dr. Gray is probably better to answer, but the, um, after the assessments have gone through interagency review, they are available for pu public peer review, and all the information on which those assessments rely is available for scientists um, outside the government or um, in general public outside the government to evaluate. Okay. Dr. Gray, did you have an answer to that question? Uh, I would agree completely with what... what, what um Ms. Dudley has just said, there, this is, no, this, this, there, there is, here the only things, there is a deliberative process with the discussions that we have with our, within the EPA and the discussions that we have with the other federal agencies. When the ultimate decisions are made, the choices, the data, the endpoints in an IRIS assessment, those are put forth in a transparent way and go out for independent external peer review to make sure that the science choices, the science assumptions, the data choices we've made are scientifically appropriate. Okay. Dr. Gray, Mr. Stevenson said a minute ago that he listed three agencies, NASA, who else? Department of DOE and DOD. They, they, they say they don't mind uh, commenting right out front, right out loud in front of God and everybody. They don't need for it to be privileged or private, deliberative. They're willing to say what they have to say publicly. Uh, are there agencies that have objected to uh, having their comments be public? The deliberative steps here were decisions that were taken by the EPA to make these steps deliberative as they've been in the past, as is done with other kinds of reviews that we have. Excuse me, sir. Do you mind if I comment on sure. that? Um, that those any agency that wants to make that information public certainly can do that during the comment period. So there's no, there's nothing in this process that would bar them from making that information public. I understand this has only been in effect since April 10, 2008, and it's designed to streamline the process so that we be more productive and that more chemicals will be assessed. Um, we won't still be waiting 11 years after formaldehyde was submitted for reevaluation. Um, and formaldehyde is, we've had a, another committee hearing, on, a subcommittee hearing on formaldehyde. It'd been, it would have been nice to have for the um, EPA and for uh, FEMA uh, and for the Centers for Disease Control to, to have a, a, a picture of formaldehyde's uh, likely toxicity, likely, likely risk based on the current science, uh, but it still hasn't happened. When are we going to know that this is actually producing more assessments? Uh, two a year, uh, four in the last two years does not seem like um, the, the changes made in 2004 
resulted in a leap in productivity. Uh, when are we going to know if this is now going to fix whatever errors there were? If Mr. Stevenson thinks that it will not, it will make it worse. When are we going to decide who, who is correct? Well, I would say that you know, we agree that there are, there are real issues with the, uh, the development of IRIS assessments and their timeliness. Um, these delays have been a longstanding issue, and it's very clear the fact that we have a significant number that have taken 10 years or more, that a lot of the delays predate any changes in this process. Our goal is to have a process that will increase the rigor and the timeliness with these timelines that will provide time uh, strict uh, milestones for EPA and for the other parties in this entire process to move this along. I think what we need now is time to implement this process, to evaluate it. It's intended to be a living document, recognizing it may need future revisions. But I think that the process that we've been using certainly hasn't gotten us to the place we want to be. Ms. Dudley? Uh, uh, you know, I, I was involved in developing the new, the new IRIS process, but the fact that it has timelines for every step along the way, including interagency review, EPA response to that, I think will both streamline, streamline the process and um, improve the quality and rigor of the resulting assessments. What are, what are the consequences of not meeting the timelines? I don't know that there are any consequences. No, I mean, these are intended These are intended as part of a management system that we're implementing so that people know on our side how we expect them to do their work and when we expect them to do their work, when we deal with the other agencies, how things go. For example, one of the things that's commonly done is to suggest to an agency, if we don't hear from you in some amount of time, we assume you have no comments. Those sorts of things may well be the way in which this would work to help make sure that things keep to the timelines. Mr. Stevenson, when do you think we'll have a sense of how well this is working? If you look at the time frames that are missing from your chart with this system, um, we already know that it's not going to work. And how, how is that? All we did is add up the time frames, which, as you just heard, may or may not have consequences. We added them up through this flow chart, and they total six years. And if it's a mission-critical system, the DOD commenter or whomever has the ability to ask for additional research, which can take up to 18 more months. Um, it's already broken. I'd, I'd like to suggest that, in fact, this, this process, I believe, can help us get done in less time than our current five and a half year per assessment average, that if you add up the timelines and remove those small fraction of, of chemicals that might be considered mission critical, that this is something that will take less time than our current process and will be more responsive, more rigorous, and more transparent. We're not thrilled with the current process. <laughs> are there, no, are there mo no milestones at all in the current process, in the previous process? There are none that are written down and publicly available. Okay. That's the improvement. It's no longer ad hoc. Now you know what the process is. Sir, I actually, um, I, have a, I have a chart that I don't know if, did you get this just before the hearing? I'm sorry that we don't have it so that you can put it up on your screen. I, I, I haven't seen it, but my, perhaps the staff has. What it does is it, um, it takes a look. EPA has data on the number of virus assessments completed going back to 1997. The GAO report reports I'm not sure what day it starts, but it, it doesn't go back as far as we have data. And that suggests that there are increases, you know, that you see increases and decreases in the assessments, but that on average in the last three years of the previous administrations, uh, there were four assessments per year, whereas the average in this between 2000 and 2007 has been 4.6. So I, I think we all agree that the process, that it is too slow and that there are ways that we need to speed that up. But um, I think it, it's not fair to characterize the previous way as, as the golden age and the, the future as a slowing of the process. I agree with that. I, I, I'm advised by our staff that we do have this, but we got it 15 minutes before the hearing. So there's not exactly been an ample opportunity to look at it closely. Um, With uh, that is the end of the hearing um, today. Thank you all for appearing. Uh, we did have an earlier hearing uh, on the issue of formaldehyde 
in clothes provided by FEMA. Uh, an IRIS, uh, an effort began in 1997 to update uh, the listing from formaldehyde. Uh, the equivalent agencies to the EPA and other developed countries list formaldehyde as a known carcinogen. Uh, we, it is still listed as a suspected carcinogen, uh, and since 1997, there has not been a revision, a completed revision of formaldehyde's um, risk to the public, uh, risk to health, risk to the environment. Uh, there were hundreds of thousands of people living um, in trailers provided by FEMA that used particle board made with formaldehyde uh, with high levels of uh, with high levels of, of formaldehyde uh, in the air uh, in, inside the trailers. Uh, with families who were displaced by Katrina um, and by Rita uh, breathing that air every day. Uh, it would have been nice uh, to have a current assessment of the health consequences of formaldehyde uh, that FEMA could have relied upon that the Centers for Disease Control could have relied upon, uh, that the Agents for, Agency for Toxic <laughs> Substances and Disease Registry, ATSDR, uh, could have relied upon instead of saying just, well, just open the windows and doors. Uh, if, if, in fact, formaldehyde is substantially, a substantially greater health risk than the now more than decade old assessment, uh, if that is the current si science. Um, there is no virtue. I agree with all of the witnesses today. There is no virtue in not knowing. Uh, there is no virtue in not finding out. Uh, this is not a process about, uh, ours is not intended to, to be health um, or risk um, management. It is not what to do about the fact that there is a risk. It is what is the risk. And there is no virtue in not knowing. Uh, but it is hard to look at EPA's performance uh, and not conclude that we are not doing a sufficiently uh, a sufficient job in determining which of the 80,000 chemicals uh, present a, a hazard and what the hazard is. Uh, so I thank all of you for appearing today, and we will pursue this further. Thank you. The hearing is adjourned.